Hi. In this video, I'd like to explore the topic of antinatalism, which comes to us by way of two separate viewers, or at least I think they're separate viewers, you can never really tell on the internet. Anyhow, the first one's name is Alan, who asks simply, what are your thoughts on antinatalism? And the second is a viewer named Malik Gabuja, or something close to that, hopefully, who asks, how are you not an antinatalist or ethilist? So, uh, many thanks to you, Alan and Malik Gabuja, hopefully, <laughs> for that idea. Anyhow, antinatalism and ethilism are worthy topics, not just because a couple of people asked about them, but because they get at the whole question of whether life is affirmable or not, and if so, how. And as usual, to enhance your viewing pleasure as well as your general sense of edification, here's a roadmap of the material in this video. And as always, you can find the same roadmap in the description section of this video, along with links to the timestamps. As you can see, I'd first like to explore the positive side of antinatalism and ethilism, and more specifically, the reasons why they're defensible and compelling ethical positions. Then I'd like to explore some possible objections that I think are fairly common, but that aren't actually very convincing. And I'd like to end by presenting what I think is the strongest alternative to antinatalism and ethylism. Okay, so we should probably start by getting a handle on what the terms antinatalism and ethylism mean, especially since they probably don't figure very prominently in most people's everyday vocabulary. Basically, the natal of antinatalism refers to birth. So, at one level, antinatalism would be a kind of anti-birth philosophy. Basically, the contention that it's not a good idea to be bringing new souls into this world, mostly because human existence is inherently difficult, painful, and unreasonable a lot of the time. Basically, when you think about it, it's not at all clear that our collective habit of populating planet Earth with ever more people is ethical or even desirable. Ethylism takes that same basic premise and extends it not only to other species, but to any possible form of consciousness or sentience. Basically, the ethyl of ethylism is life spelled backwards, which suggests that life in any form is a dubious proposition. In fact, a kind of condemnation, and that any honest appraisal of the actual value of life would have to contend with that unpleasant reality. So at one level, both antinatalism and ethylism are ways of responding to the difficult, suffering side of life. But they're also ways of questioning our ethical responsibility in bringing people into this world in the first place. However, in the final analysis, I'd say that the most important question running through antinatalism and ethylism has to do with whether life itself is ultimately affirmable. In any case, both antinatalism and ethylism are obviously not very politically correct or, quote, appropriate ideas, mostly because they call into question some of our most habitual and cherished values. And because of that, it's probably pretty tempting simply to dismiss both antinatalism and ethylism out of hand, or perhaps out of a deeply ingrained sense of repulsion, without first considering why anyone would ask whether life is ultimately affirmable in the first place. So, let's see if we can avoid that little trap, which is essentially the trap of clinging to an obstinate closed-mindedness, by taking a few minutes to appreciate an antinatalist position, even if doing so seems a bit daunting at first. After all, if we really care about becoming deep and passionate thinkers, well, then at some point we need to learn to go where it's difficult to go and understand what's difficult to understand. And in the case of antinatalism and ethylism, that means that we're going to have to spend a little time exploring life's darker and more unsettling latitudes. And probably the first case in point would involve recognizing that life involves a lot of pain and suffering. Perhaps one of the starkest and most concise rendering of that reality comes to us by way of Buddhism's first noble truth, which is simply, life is suffering, or dukkha in Pali. And there's a similar word in Sanskrit. But <laughs> let's try to translate that insight into somewhat more measured and accessible terms. Have you ever noticed that when you think about it, 
there seem to be a lot more unpleasant or painful experiences in life than there are genuinely pleasurable ones. Basically, we start crying and screaming the instant we come into this world, and it remains a fairly frequent theme throughout our lives. And while we experience pleasurable moments too, the problem has to do with the lopsided proportions involved. From that perspective, it's probably no accident that arguably the single most famous passage in all of English literature has to do with recognizing that reality. It's Hamlet's soliloquy from Act 3, Scene 1, and in it he says that life is full of all kinds of things like the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. And in fact, there's so much of all of that sort of thing that eventually, to be or not to be, does indeed become not a question, but the question. But even if you're not a particularly melancholy Dane, have you ever noticed how much tedium, frustration, cruelty, callousness, unfulfilled longing, grinding mundaneity, sadness, humiliation, stupidity, desperation, pain, strife, tragedy, rejection, misunderstanding, etc., etc., there is in the world? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed how many oceans of all of that we have to cross in order to reach life's relatively few islands of genuine satisfaction and sanctuary? And have you noticed that even when we do manage to reach those sunny shores, it doesn't usually last very long? Normally, just a few minutes of blissful respite before we're once again thrown into the seething maelstrom of life's stormy seas. And if you haven't noticed all of that, well, here's an example that might strike a little closer to home. Have you ever noticed how most of us have to spend the largest fraction of our lives laboring for someone else? Basically, living a life governed largely by other people's desires and designs, with only a relatively small fraction of our lives to call our own. It's really a very common phenomenon in our world. But once again, from an antinatalist perspective, the problem isn't that that sort of thing happens every now and then. The problem has to do with the ridiculously lopsided proportions involved, and consequently with how painfully oppressive life is a lot of the time. And so at that point, the antinatalist question becomes, is it actually ethical to be bringing people into a world like this one, a world disproportionately filled with tears and misery, where suffering is pretty much the coin of the realm on planet Earth? But when you think about it, the deeper question running through antinatalism isn't so much about the calculus of pain and pleasure that can cause us to question life's ultimate affirmability. After all, as Viktor Frankl has illustrated so well, we human beings can endure immense amounts of suffering when we feel like there's some sort of meaning in it. So even if life does involve a disproportionate amount of suffering, that's not necessarily an objection to its ultimate affirmability, because meaning can always redeem and alleviate our suffering by allowing us to make sense of it. But here the question is, what makes us think that the meanings we fabricate to make sense of our suffering are in any way essential, <laughs> or even relevant, to life's larger reality? For instance, let's look at meaning the way Viktor Frankl conceives of it, which is in terms of striving to fulfill worthwhile goals. Well, the obvious reality is that sometimes we manage to fulfill the goals and projects we've construed as meaningful, but a lot of the time it simply never happens. In fact, a fair fraction of the time, life will seemingly go out of its way to prevent it from ever happening. For instance, let's say that we think that it's a pretty meaningful thing to be a basically decent person and to live a more or less happy, constructive life in the process. Well, the obvious truth is that sometimes things work out that way, but a lot of the time they don't. In fact, horrible things happen to good people all the time, 
and life will cut down a good person just as quickly as it will a bad one. And on the other side of the coin, a lot of the time the most rotten, depraved people on the planet end up getting away with their dastardly deeds. No matter how you slice it, there's a lot of randomness in the equation of meaning and its fulfillment. In essence, life just doesn't care about whether we achieve our meaningful goals or not. It doesn't organize itself around our hopes and dreams, and it doesn't care about our grandiose projects and accomplishments either. And consequently, the stories we tell ourselves about what is meaningful are just that. Stories with precious little relevance to the larger workings of life. And yeah, those sorts of stories can definitely help us get through some difficult times. But it would be a mistake to think that finding meaning in our suffering would somehow make life affirmable. After all, just because we found a way of enduring less pain doesn't automatically make life good. It just means that things aren't as bad as they might otherwise be. <laughs> but they're still bad. So, whether we're able to find meaning in our suffering or not, the deeper truth is that, in one way or another, every one of us has little choice but to endure the long, harrowing night of this world, always dreaming of a consummation that might somehow redeem our pain, a final, definitive consummation that might balance the scales of our suffering. But the deeper reality is that we're always left dreaming, but never knowing. Never really knowing whether our deepest desires, the ones smoldering in the center of our souls, will ever really come to pass. And so we find ourselves moving moment by moment through our heavy weight of days in this world, suspended for a lifetime over the infinite abyss of life's unfathomable indifference. And in light of that stark reality, the essential question of antinatalism and ephalism is, whatever made us think that human existence is worthwhile in the first place, other than our self-serving habit of clinging to any narrative that would disguise the hard, unforgiving reality of human existence? And here we should perhaps make note of a few of those narratives. In the Western world, probably first and foremost would be believing in a God who would somehow sort out all of life's obvious difficulties in a way that far exceeds the can of our limited human comprehension. But even that all-encompassing bromide doesn't really resolve antinatalism's ethical concerns. Of course, on one hand, it definitely simplifies things when it seems like our only option is to obey the biblical orthodoxy that tells us to be fruitful and multiply. But on the other hand, blindly following that mandate seems ethically dubious when the souls we would be bringing into this world stand a fair chance of being condemned to a hell of eternal torment, in addition to having to endure a lifetime of difficulties in our worldly veil of tears. It's a uh, little like bringing a little kid up to the edge of a dangerous cliff where a lot of other kids have died in the past, and then praying that he doesn't manage to fall off at some point. Because the truth is that maybe he will, and maybe he won't. But the antinatalist question would be, <laughs> what makes us think that it was such a great idea to bring him up there in the first place? But aside from religiously oriented narratives, these days a much more common way of responding to the position of antinatalism probably has to do with adopting a secular, Pollyanna point of view that simply refuses to think about how unreasonable and difficult life is in the first place. And probably the most common way of doing that these days is to spend our lives drifting in the never-ending narcosis of consumer and entertainment culture and letting our addiction to unremitting distraction run rampant, all of which I would say is a fairly common phenomenon in our world today. And in my view, that's also a big part of why antinatalism sounds so caustic and abrasive to a lot of our politically correct sensibilities. It's because antinatalism is asking us to think deeply about what we're doing in a world 
where thinking deeply about anything has become a strange and unpopular thing to do. In other words, it's suggesting that we really have no idea what we're doing, and we're generating ever more ethically indefensible suffering in the process. So here the question becomes, is it ethical to shut down our higher cortical functions by deferring to the dynamics of popular culture if the cost of doing so is to generate more suffering in the world? And I think that the obvious answer is, uh, <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> and maybe at this point the question is, well, if all of that is true, then is there any coherent convincing response to antinatalism and ephilism? If ignoring the enormity of human suffering doesn't work, and if centering our response on the meaning of our suffering doesn't work either, and if seeking solace in religious narratives is really little more than a fanciful and incoherent dodge, as is steeping ourselves in the narcosis of secular commodity and entertainment culture, then what would a compelling alternative to antinatalism and ephilism be? <coughs> is there even one? And here I'm going to give you what I think is personally the best answer, although there are certainly many possible skeptical objections to it. And I'm going to introduce it with a quote from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. In The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche rather famously opines that it is only as an aesthetic event that existence and the world are eternally justified. Of course, whether any given person finds that idea convincing probably depends a lot on how he or she experiences the aesthetic side of life, especially with respect to how much we have to suffer in this world. And, uh, I, by the way, those aren't necessarily two mutually exclusive categories, since there can also be an aesthetic side to suffering. But in any case, it's definitely a personal, and I would say experiential question, whether or not it's possible for aesthetic experience to justify or redeem or counterbalance the suffering side of human existence. But I'd also say that if any answer could possibly yield a non-trivial affirmation of life, it would be something like aesthetic experience. That's partly because of its immediacy. Basically, when we experience the beauty of things, it doesn't depend on whether or not we're clinging to this or that belief system or this or that meaning for our lives or this or that element of popular culture or even on how much we're suffering. Instead, the immediacy of aesthetic experience subtends all of that. Experiences of sudden and inexplicable beauty strike us like lightning, directly and definitively, exactly where we live and breathe, and in a way that subtends all of our beliefs, meanings, sufferings, etc. But perhaps more importantly, aesthetic experience has the power to transform us to shift and alter our way of perceiving the world. It has enough power to draw us toward the outermost liminal surface of things, where we can begin to see with other eyes and measure with other measures, as Eugen Harigel says. In other words, aesthetic experience is powerful enough to turn our lives into a kind of adventure, rather than just a plodding endurance contest. An adventure where all of life's agony and all of its staggering beauty unfold in an ongoing reciprocal dynamism. And when you think about it, what is adventure without difficulty, without danger, without pain, and ultimately without the sensation of beauty to make it worthwhile? And when you think about it a little more, what adventure could be greater than that of expanding our consciousness and deepening our perceptual fields, which of course can easily become an aesthetic experience in its own right, a way of drinking in the beauty of what we ourselves are. But at this point, it's probably good to remember that the aesthetic of human existence also unfolds in an integral relation to everything that is repulsive and ugly in this world, and in ourselves, too. Aesthetic experience isn't just about extolling the virtues of the bright, cheery side of life at the expense of its larger totality. 
Instead, it's about learning to take in all that life is, to view life honestly and forthrightly, even when it's difficult to do so, to encounter life directly and honestly, and hence to recognize all of the reasons we have to hate life, as well as all the reasons we have to love it, because the real art of being human is to learn to balance the horror of existence against the beauty of it. And in that regard, I'd say that antinatalism and ephalism are offering us something truly invaluable, a relatively rare opportunity to glimpse how difficult and how painful life really is, and consequently, an opportunity to recognize all of the reasons we have to despise it. That's important because it's only against that dark backdrop that our love for life can become something realistic and substantive and not just a kind of adolescent fantasy or a case of wishful thinking. That's because in the adult world, <laughs> which is to say the real world, we love each other or life itself not because we expect the object of our affection to be perfect or never to cause us pain. Rather, we love with an intimate knowledge of each other's flaws and imperfections, but we love anyhow, perhaps even precisely because of those imperfections. After all, as Voltaire once famously noted, the perfect is actually the enemy of the good. So why should it be any different when it comes to the question of whether we love life? or whether we find it affirmable in some deep sense. Perhaps, at the end of the day, we love life not because life deserves it, but because, well, because despite everything we perceive to the contrary, we're still able to find beauty in it, whether life deserves our affirmation or not. But, like I said, all of that's a pretty personal thing. And if you see things differently, well, you're certainly entitled to do so. In any case, thanks so much for watching. I'm glad that you're here. And that's here <laughs> with a big capital H, which is to say, in the universe, in the seething vortex of life itself. And, of course, as always, Take care of your soul.